Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's, it's recording right now. Okay, then, wait a minute. I got to get up here and say continue. Yay. Okay, very good. Brent, I'm so glad you're with us, but we sure wish we could see your face. Okay, I'll do it, but my, I'm messy because I can't get to it, a haircut. I finally got mine cut this week, but it was by somebody who obviously did not know how to cut hair. I'm really sorry. Well, That's why I'm still wearing my cap. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I'm the same way. I'm not leaving my little my little compound. My property line is is my line. Uh, I know what you mean. Well, my my hair was down to my shoulders, which it hasn't been since a very long time ago, and it was horrible, just horrible. I'm looking though, and Mickey, yours is long now, and it's beautiful. Yes, it is. Yay, Thank Mickey. You. <laughs> uh, okay, so Brent, tell us about you. Well, now that you're recording, I have to watch what I say. Right. Uh, <laughs> there's not much to say. Uh, I come to these meetings. I go to other meetings. Uh, I'm interested <laughs> in ham stuff. That's why I have K6ZIF up there for another meeting which requires it. Um, I appreciate all of you. I, since I've been locked in my, my, uh, my little room here and uh, our grounds, we've taken up more gardening and, uh, and I'm a beekeeper now. Yay, and, uh, save the bees. Yeah, and that's all doing, doing quite well. Uh, much better than the first year. The first year we didn't do well and over the uh, from the summer to through the winter, we had to requeen three times, but we yeah. finally got a queen that would stick around. And so now we have hives that are really doing quite well. So we think we'll probably be okay. Uh, Aaron has trained me a couple times, but even with her good training, it seems to seep out of my head. So I'm not sure <laughs> if I'm even allowed to do things anymore. Um, I don't know. I've become the plumber, the gardener, uh, the, the handyman, and uh, boy, it keeps me busy. <laughs> That's about it, K6ZIF. Thank you, Brent. Linda, unmute yourself and let us see your pretty face. Brenda Cano? Brenda, I know you're there. <laughs> to unmute yourself, go down to the bottom left of your screen. And you should see a microphone, and if you click on that, it will unmute you. Okay, well, Brenda, catch up with us later. We want to talk with you. You can also try hitting the space bar. Oh, okay. Try hitting the space bar. How's, how's Yay, there you are. Yay. Hello. <laughs> hey, um, I'm also the call-in user because I have a very unstable um internet connection and if i call in i can listen to the audio oh okay so tell us about you so, so that mystery calling user is me <laughs> <laughs> what was that tell so us I, about um, you are, are you short trained so or are you, are you, to be here are normally i have a work uh meeting at this time okay we understand, but we're glad you're with us for a little while anyway. Right. Thank you for coming. Christy, is that Christy Adair? Unmute yourself, sweetie. Christy. Hi, sorry. Hey. <laughs> Can't ever find my cursor. <laughs> Let us see your picture. I'm trying to get that working. I just. One second, but hi everybody, it's so good to see you. <laughs> great to see, well, it'll be great to see you. <laughs> as soon as I get my coffee. <laughs> great to hear you. So is there anything happening with CERT right now that we should know about? Well, there's a lot happening in the background, um, but not a lot going on for the CERT active members or the full CERT callout team, but we are starting to do um, one class that's gonna be an online class. There's gonna be 25 people 
in it. And actually, Captain Ignatzik is the one who's driving the driving force behind getting the CERT class online. And it's not going to be pre recorded, it's going to be an actual live class. And they're starting it with just 25 people because um, they just want to make sure that they have all the technical issues out of the way with the with the smaller class. And then we're going to open it up live to, you know, 100 people, 200 people if they want to join. So we are working on the classes with the new curriculum that changed um, this time last year. So it's, it's taken a while. A lot of the um, energy has gone from CERT and been directed towards COVID testing and now COVID vaccination. So it's a new world. Okay. Well, thank uh, you for that info. That's so exciting that you're going to be doing online classes. I think that's great. Thank you. Christy, uh, the uh, documentation for that new curriculum uh, on the uh, CERT-LA website? I don't think it's up there yet. Uh, we're still um, playing around with it. But okay. the actual, the original evidence of evidence, the original curriculum is on the FEMA website. And it was updated, I think it was January of 2020 that the new curriculum was rolled out or maybe a few months before. But there are some changes to the medical curriculum and I think terrorism. I haven't looked at it in a while. <clears throat> but there's some generalities versus um, specifics for medical because I think it was confusing, like triage was confusing people. So they just made it very vanilla. Like you need a doctor, you don't need a doctor. <laughs> okay. So I can get rid of all that yellow, green and red duct tape. <laughs> Not necessarily because some cities are able to enhance the curriculum to how they operate in their protocols. And I think that's probably what um, LAFD is going to do. So hang on to that tape. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Christy. Okay. And our call in user we found out is Brenda. So um, did anybody or everybody have a chance to take a look at our? minutes from the December meeting? And if so, are there any changes? Okay. All right, Linda Schwering, I made a few minor changes, mostly typos when I sent these out to people. So use that as the official, <laughs> as the official minutes. Is there a motion to accept the minutes as presented? Yes, put a motion to accept the minutes as uh, presented. Okay, and any opposed? Motion passes. Woohoo! Excellent. And Linda, Linda, yes. go back and get someone to second the motion. Oh, okay. Uh, and then vote Sandy, on it again. Sandy, Sandy put the motion forward. Is there a second? A second. Maggie seconded. Okay, now vote okay. on it again. All right. Any uh, any opposition to the motion? Motion passes as with the minutes as presented. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Um, committee reports. Well, we don't have anybody here from the police department and James Brown is not with us this morning. So Dan, we're up to you. Unmute yourself. Uh, okay, yeah. um, I'm gonna share my screen if it's okay. Sure. Uh, can you all see the map? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple meetings ago, I talked about the alert wildfire cameras. And yeah. I'm on the, the wildfire camera monitoring team for LA CERT. Actually found a fire the last time I was on there. Wow. Uh, by, by the time I convinced the powers that be that it was a new fire and not an existing one, it had been reported through normal channels, but uh, at least I found the fire. Um, anyway, <laughs> this is another tool uh, called Wi Fire. And I find it much easier to monitor the cameras and other things via this map. And what's cool about it is you can define what you want to look at. So 
if you see up in the upper right hand corner here, this that stack of paper uh, icon. If I want to know what the weather is like, I can click on weather stations. And now it's showing me the wind speeds. In this case, you can see down here, it's the wind um, at various locations. Um, I can change that to gusts and it tells me the gust speed and direction, which is pretty cool. Um, if I wanna look at the wildfire cameras, I can look at them and the path, the current path of the camera is showing. And if I want to actually see what the camera is looking at, I can double click on it. Uh, why is that not opening? There we go. And I can take a look at the camera and see what it's looking at. Wow. So that's pretty cool. Um, but that's not all. There's more. I can look at the fuels in the area. So if I want to look at uh, uh, the surface fuels, it will tell me what kind of fuels are in that particular area, which is wow. pretty cool. I can look at um, canopy cover. So it shows me what the overhead canopy looks like. Um, uh, can you show me vegetation? Yeah, if I can get the others to stop showing. Uh, fuels. Wow. So a lot of good information there. Thank you. You bet. Um, I can look at historical fire perimeters. Go back here and look, and it tells us the uh, the name of the fire and all that. So, from a standpoint of of, and there's a ton of other stuff I haven't figured out yet. But um, when it comes to monitoring the cameras, uh, this makes it much easier to figure out what we're looking at because now I can see on this map multiple cameras that may cover the same area, and by taking the path of two cameras, I can more precisely know what I'm looking at and, and where that new column of smoke may be coming from. So anyway, it's a really cool uh, tool and uh, we're starting to include that in our alert wildfire uh, bag of tricks. And uh, maybe at some point I'll, I can get better acquainted with it and do a little more uh, uh, in-depth uh, look at that tool, but uh, it's there. You can see the uh, uh, the link to it is firemap.sdsc.edu. Say that uh, again, please, that, Dan. Yeah, you should be able to see it on my screen here. Fire Firemap.sdsc, Sierra Delta, Sierra Charlie, dot edu. Thank you. Hey, so, and, um, cool tool. Linda Schwering has her hand up. Linda? Linda? Yes, I did, but you just answered my question. Thank <laughs> you very much. So other than that, um, you know, even though we're not meeting in person, we continue to do a ton of training online. Uh, we're really working hard on WinLink. Uh, WinLink, which uh, we did some training on that a couple meetings ago is uh, to remind you is email over radio. It's, it's more than that, but that's the key. Um, we continue to train on that. We're adding more uh, gateway stations so that more people can connect directly. Uh, there's been some updates in the software that lets us, if we can't connect directly, we may be able to connect through an intermediary station. Um, so that's really fun. Uh, a lot of the uh, both governmental and non-governmental agencies are taking um, WinLink and adapting that sort of as their digital communication standard. Um, uh, Red Cross, um, uh, FEMA, of course, uh, SHARES, which is a federal government essentially a radio system that's outside the FCC control 
and in frequencies other than ham and commercial frequencies, uh, LA City is working on uh, uh, getting shares licenses that that should happen, I think, soon. Um, and in which case, uh, we have other means of communicating. Uh, should the airwaves become really congested, which we expect they will. So WinLink is, is going forward. Uh, a lot of other training. Um, seems like I spend a lot of my time on Zoom, but it's a great tool. So that's about it for me. Uh, Dan, was that wifire.com? Uh, no, it's FireMap. No, I got that. I got that one. But okay. at the beginning, you mentioned wifire.something. No, wifire is the name of the tool, but the the source the source of the material is at FireMap. Okay. Wifire right. Wifire is just the name of the tool. I got you. Okay, thank you. All right, very good. Well, please don't forget our um, Sunday morning ham radio net, nine o'clock, 145.75 on Simplex. Um, if you are a new ham, we love to help new hams get started. And uh, we're very- Linda, it's 145.57. I'm sorry, dyslexia kicking in this morning, 145.57. <laughs> Thank you. And then our FRS GMRS walkie talkie net is at 10 o'clock and you do not have to have a license. You can get these radios almost everywhere. Uh, SOS has them, Costco quite often has them. Sometimes you can get them at drug stores or grocery stores even, but they're inexpensive. You can get a really nice set for probably 69.95, but they come even cheaper than that. And they're a great way to communicate uh, without a license. It's very, it, it's inexpensive and easy to do, and it could be a lifesaver in the event of a disaster. And it's how we're going to let people know that our bins are open at Lake Balboa Neighborhood Council. So please um, do get on, on to the FRS GMRS net. It's fun. You'll meet some great people on there. Hey, Linda? Yes. Uh, when uh, you know when uh, Bill Hopkins passed away, uh, he left uh, most of his radio gear to Los Angeles Aries, and uh, Rosie and I were over there to uh, take an initial scope on stuff. One of the things that we will have available for sale is uh, one of the uh, the uh, uh, <clears throat> Midland. Uh, Mo the Midland uh, GMRS mobile radios that Dan and I and others use. So uh, if somebody has or is going to get the GMRS license and is interesting interested in getting one of the, uh, the 45 watt mobiles at less than uh, you know less than uh, full market price, uh, let me know. Thank you very much for that, Marty. No, I did not know he had left his radio equipped to Aries. That's great to know. Bless his heart. I miss him so doggone much. Yeah, me too. It's crazy. I can't go shopping without thinking about him. I think about him all the time. I know. It, it's amazing. And particularly on Friday afternoons, I think about him because that's when he and Dave and I would get together as, as the board for Valley Disaster stuff. And um uh, yeah, and, and the minutes have really gone downhill since he stopped <laughs> nitpicking us. <Yeah. laughs> True. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Hey, thank you um, so much, Marty. Yes, Sandy? Thank you. I just wanted to say, because I know we don't have like a police officer here, but I think it's important. When we had our Lake Bobo Neighborhood Council meeting, Officer Fuentes uh, was, uh, well, is one of our slows, but he unfortunately is moving from uh, Lake Balboa to Reseda. So we're right. gonna be getting a new uh, police officer named Officer Clark to um, our area. And uh, that will take place on the 15th, I believe, because we have uh, Officer Fuentes until the 14th, till tomorrow. And then he goes to Reseda and it's a shame. He is, a, I mean, he's been a great asset to Lake Balboa. Um, yes. And to my area in particular, um, very, very uh, present 
and just was just fan, you know fantastic. We still have Officer Smith, but um, it'll be interesting to meet Officer Clark. And uh, just wanted to share that update. Well, we in Reseda we haven't had a slow in like a year. Yeah, wow. it, I live in ten oh four RD, and uh, it'd be nice to have some representation. Oh, he's been, he's just phenomenal. You're very, very fortunate to have yeah, him. Yeah, really like sure. him. By the way, I, uh, on the police matter, uh, I talked to Len Schaefer, uh, who's uh, the, on the board of neighborhood commissioners, and he's also a ham, and we talk regularly on a variety of things. And uh, he was talking to uh, the, uh, <clears throat> some of the uh, brass at LAPD, and apparently the Valley uh, is going down. They're going to lose... Uh, a number of officers to retirement pretty quickly. Uh, they're going to be down for the valley to about 900 on patrol. That's for the entire valley for all shifts. Uh, mm. You compare that with comparably populated and sized Chicago, where they have 10,400. So, um, and he said a lot of the seasoned folks, um, including the female officers who who joined, you know, 20, 30 years ago, they're all retiring and you're just he said response times are going to get really really slow so just be aware uh linda schwering has her hand up oh linda yes i i lowered it i think well i can do this now this is for dan the last two weekends that we've had the uh frs gmrs radio net the person that you heard that you couldn't understand what they were saying that was me. I could, <laughs> I could hear you all loud and clear, but for some reason, it wasn't going the other direction. So yes, I was there, and I will try it. How did I know it was you then? I know. <laughs> Were you on a handheld, Linda? Yeah, I was. I was on my uh, on my FRS radio, standing in the middle of the street, and okay. everybody came through fine, even those that were relayed from far away. But. Uh, Check and see if it has a high low power setting. It may shift between half watt and two watts. Make sure you're on the high power setting. That may help. Okay. I'll I'll run through it before tomorrow. Okay. And the reason I'm not on the ham net right now is that I'm having problems with my radio. Uh, I can hear everybody, but I can't make you all hear me. So not quite sure what's going on there, but anyway. Okay, excellent. Thank you all very much. We now have a period for public comment on non-agenda items. Anybody have anything they want to share? I had a comment. Okay, Bernard. Um, earlier we talked about uh, that spin write, but if you back up your files to a flash drive, to a hard drive, to a solid state drive and have multiple backups, Hopefully you won't need something like spin right and keep them in multiple locations. So if you put you know, all your eggs in one basket and the house floods, um, your data may be lost. So I have a hard drive in the safe deposit box with all my pictures, all my data, all my files. And I update it about every six months. So the latest stuff is right here on my desk and in a uh, drawer, but uh, I, I back up and have it in a separate location. And you know, pictures, pictures are a little over two terabytes at the moment. So yeah, from uh, 1999. Um, was there anything else? Um, I didn't take notes, so I forgot. Back okay. to you. We have two hands up. First is Heidi and second is Dave Brown. So Heidi, go ahead, please. Um, I just wanted to let people know what's happening with LA Animal Services. Um, they still have the two um, shelters closed down right now, North Central and West Valley. Um, they're thinking of changing West Valley status so it's no longer completely controlled by LA Animal Services. So the services on the west side are gonna be reduced. Um, the uh, councilman, John Lee, is opposed to this as, as are most people on the West Valley because 
you, they will not be able to intake animals there. Mm -hmm. um, what they're planning on doing possibly is having other rescue groups um, use the space for their animals and for adoptions and things. Um, so uh, a lot of people are very upset about that. Um, uh, one good thing that they're doing is they're expanding the pet food pantry. Uh, they're gonna be uh, open every Sunday from one to four at uh, Chesterfield Square, which is South Central, and then at the East Valley Shelter. Um, you just have to make an appointment to come in. And if you go to laanimalservices.com, uh, if you look under, I think, events, um, you can find on the calendar, it will show up the, the, um, the, all the information that you need for the different Sundays. Um, and that's starting uh, this weekend. They're gonna start um, doing it every weekend. And um, let's see. Oh, they're also starting a new program probably in March or April. It's for people who uh, temporarily need to house their animal, but they can't take them with them. For example, if they lost their home, but they're looking for a new place to stay. Uh, it's basically, they're starting off with dogs first so that they will, they're asking the volunteers to um, uh, take in as fosters uh, for between a month to six months, uh, other people's dogs. Um, it's also for like, if the, you're in the military and you can't take your dog with you to wherever you're moving to temporarily. Um, for women who uh, are in an abuse situation and they want to get out of the situation, but they can't take the dog to wherever they're uh, relocating temporarily. Um, so it's kind, of, it's kind of to help the community with a temporary housing for their, for their dogs. And hopefully at some point they'll, they'll also do that for cats as well. Sally? Yeah, uh, Heidi. Um, hang on. Uh, Dave Brown was first. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. Dave? Oh, go ahead, Sally, because I think you were going to ask Heidi something. Yeah, I just was going to ask her. I mean, I, I don't guess I quite understand why that's legal to do that to the West Valley when it was our tax dollars that funded West Valley and uh, built the facility. I don't uh, know how they can lease it or whatever they're doing to private or even nonprofit organizations. Well, it's sort of the same thing they're doing with Best Friends because where Best Friends is now is actually one of the city shelters, but they're leasing it out to them for a minimal amount of money. Um, the reason why they're, they're saying they're doing it is because of a loss of, of um, money because of, of the um, financial situation with Los Angeles. They're not getting, you know, the income is less, so they're trying to save money. Um, so what, can people drop their, their animals off there? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, right now it's closed. So right. North Central and, and mm -hmm. West Valley are closed. I'm not sure um, at what point they're going to decide um, what they're going to do with it. But I believe you cannot drop off any animals there. So you'd have to go to East Valley. That would be the closest uh, shelter. So what kind of do you happen to know how it would be run? Because I know Best Friends people take animals over there. Well, Best, best Friends is a different situation, mm -hmm. but um, with with West Valley, what they're gonna you're gonna be able to like register your dog for a license and that kind of thing, but you're not gonna be able to bring in a dog that you find on the street. Do, would you happen to know? Last question: If they would do adoptions there. No, Boy, um, that's at least not from the city city point of view. I think maybe if the if their rescue groups are um, uh, in there, I think they probably will be able to. I can send you what the general manager, the official paperwork that she sent that talks about it. I can send it to Linda and maybe she can disperse it. Right. It's just a shame because West Valley, they have uh, heated outdoors you know, facility for the dogs that are on the outside pens and it's a brand new location compared to East Valley. But uh, I guess it is what it is. 
And also we can take farm animals. I mean, we had pigs and horses. They have stalls for horses. Right. Um, you know, we just like right before the uh, pandemic, they finally finished getting air conditioning for the rabbits. Yeah, it's it's uh, to me, it's more political. And but I won't you know, I don't know. I know it's all budget and money, but uh, it I don't know. It's too bad they couldn't have we couldn't have no more about it and petitioned. There is uh, a petition going around on this. I got yeah, I signed it, but it's a long time ago. No, I just got one a couple of weeks ago. Oh, good. Somebody's okay. going because they're really upset about this. So you really, we all have to scream about them shutting it down as a shelter because it's- Absolutely. Because yeah, it leaves the West side totally vulnerable. All the animals that yeah. happen to get lost. Yeah. People are probably not going to go all the way to East Valley. Right. Up to and East Valley is crammed. Yeah, they'll just dump them. Yeah. I mean, it's, this is ridiculous, but yeah, well. I'll look for the petition. Thank you. Dave? Yeah, speaking of the animal shelter, it's probably worth learning about. The lady that's a friend of the mayor's wife that has some involvement in that. Uh, somebody said politics. Uh, big thank you to Bernard for the massive reminder about the importance of backing up. I wish I'd paid better attention or, or had it engraved somewhere or painted like graffiti on the wall. Uh, because that, that one of the consequences of what I've been going through now for a while is the result of not having properly backed up. So let that let me be a lesson and a warning to all of you. Uh, what I had to mention quickly is spiral three ring notebooks, apparently not real big oversized ones, just regular size, but super high quality. I don't know if they're gift boxed or whatever, but a large quantity of them um, are up for grabs for free. Monday morning, uh, we're doing a good deed project with uh, Monica Rodriguez, council member, and we're gonna pick up eight pallets of them. Apparently they're on pallets, stacked, shrink wrapped, seven feet high. Uh, we're gonna grab eight pallets for her, and she's gonna distribute them through her local schools once they figure out how to do that. Um, I've yet to see them, whoever, my contact is that talked me into helping them, uh, says they're really nice for what that's worth. So if anybody needs a spiral, three ring spiral notebooks, contact me, send me a text, email, call, whatever. And as soon as I get one, I'll have a picture of it that I can reply to you with. And you can determine if, uh, if you want some. Apparently we can only hold eight pallets, but apparently they have 60 pallets available, but everything needs to be gone within like 10 days or something. So. Uh, there you have it. Okay, we have two people with their hands raised. First is Brenda, and second is Linda Schwerin. Brenda? Brenda? Hello. Yes. Hi, uh, I have a comment about the Best Friends facility in Mission Hills. Yes. By agreement with the city, they can only take dogs and cats directly from city shelters. So the public cannot drop off animals there either. Okay. So people should be aware of that. Thank you, Brenda. Who is next? Sandy? Linda Schwering. Linda Schwering. Oh, yes. I did. Now I almost forgot what I was going to ask. Oh. With regard to the petition that Maggie mentioned, where would I look online to see if I could get a copy of that? I got an email from somebody, and of course I can't find it. So, and I did answer them, but I've got it somewhere, and I can. Maggie, if you'll send it to me, I'll put it out to the group. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anybody else for comments? on non-agenda items. Okay, well that brings us to our program. And our favorite speaker, our guru of emergency preparedness, whom we all love dearly. Erin, it's all up to you and unmute yourself. Oh my Yay. Gosh, there's so many great, I you know, there's so many great topics. Um, 
I'm actually starting my master's program this year in public health. It's something I've wanted to do for a long time, and the VA is going to pay for it. So I'm like, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. Congratulations. It's wonderful. The public health is so fascinating because all roads lead. It sounds crazy, but the truth be told, all roads of health lead to emergency preparedness, even if it's our health. Hmm. You stop and think about it, right? Like we really love the fire extinguisher and we really love the first aid kit and we really love, love, love. But even our diet, like that's a, a journey. I'm like, I've lost 30 pounds this past year. So I'm you really- look wonderful. Right, because your fitness is really part of it. We were having a really strong discussion in Ventura County about this, um, about how sworn people get nervous a little bit because you know, really it's the baby boomers who are occupying the bulk of volunteerism at this time, one because of our population footprint. And then of course, you know, the other is like my daughter was sharing with me and her friends from high school, it is very difficult for them to be able to survive, to work as many jobs that many of us scored really good jobs. And the kind of jobs like, you know, uh, pensions like mine are a thing of the past. Um, now, why am I saying all that? I did pull up the burn, the new burn protocol for CERT, national CERT, uh, to share with the group today. It is Burn Awareness Week. Yes, yes, it is um, from the 9th to the 13th. And I'm going to go ahead and then Sandy, um, you and I are both really savvy with Zoom. So if you can... Um, I'm going to open up my screen. It's already open, so we need to share my screen. Is that feasible? Either co-host me or something like that? You can't do that? Wait, you're muted, sister. Yeah, yeah. Give me one second. Yeah. Okay. Aaron, is there any way you could turn your sound up a little? Yes. I agree. Well, that's as loud as it gets unless I go army and I just start shouting. Okay. okay. All right. I made you co-host. I thought it was just me, but but. Uh, you know, I I guess there's a. I got to get an external mic for this. I've had a couple other people say something. I'm gonna I'm gonna start over here, and I'm gonna go into share screen. Start here we go. And I'm gonna share, and I'm gonna open this up. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is national. Uh, now it's uh, notice it's Mark Byrne. Right, and then AI, evil AI, you know, automated information technology, uh, they make it like a name. And it's uh, funny, if you go, if you want to laugh, go Google National Burn Week and you're going to see it's going to say Mark Bum. And it's the funniest thing. I don't know who Mark is or about his bum, but apparently it's affiliated with National Burn Week. But just know that all the fire departments have been out there, they're PIOs. Here's LAF uh, Pasadena Fire doing their things. And I want you guys to know who some of the players are, because it's one thing we're really good at at Lake Balboa is sharing who the players are in our communities, because so many of us are aware of people who are in different areas. So these people, the Elisa and Roosh Burn Foundation, I ran into them 30 years ago reading their gas meter. They used to be on Sherman Way in Reseda. And they're one of the more elite groups that do this. And this was a girl who was about my age. And she uh, she died tragically of a fire, like when she was 10 years old. No. But they run uh, camps for children who are burn survivors. And they have a program of senior prevention and risk conversations with seniors. Um, because they're, and also they do it for children with autism and um, Asperger's because these children, um, they need different needs to educate them on stop, drop and roll and fire prevention. But anyway, this is just a wonderful organization that's local to the Valley. Um, as you can see, they have recreational programs. They have emotional and financial uh, support for burn victims. And they tend to have some of the most cutting edge education on burn prevention. Our own local group, the Elisa and Rouge Burn Foundation. So I just wanna let you know that they're out there. If you go to the end of resources, that's where you're gonna find a lot of really cool stuff for them. Here is Spark, and this is about the senior prevention. 
One thing that they did because of seniors, and I'm not going to get up yet, Sandy. I am going to go to my phone uh, as soon as I close this. You know, when you buy a stove nowadays, if it's a freestanding stove, one thing you have to have drilled into the floor at the back of the stove is a foot that holds a corner of the stove down so it cannot be tipped forward. Because seniors, they have found statistically, are using the handle of the oven door as like a cane. And it's how they, you know, they use it for balancing in the kitchen. Here, raise your hand if you've done that before. Guilty, right? Well, the problem is, is that if it's on, the doors have opened and the people have fallen on top of the oven door and then either spilling the contents of food being cooked on top of the oven, uh, the stove top, excuse me, um, or even tilting the entire oven over and trapping uh, the person. Even if the oven is off, of course, this can create some really um, serious situations. Uh, so it's just the, they're out there. It's a program. They're looking for volunteers uh, to put these things on. Um, I'm going to look more into it and see if they can be done virtually. I'm sure they can. Um, and so this is one way to do community outreach about educating people about burns in their homes. And that's the Elisa Ann Roosh Burn Foundation. Um, if somebody can capture that, or maybe just go ahead and um, if you want this to be forwarded so people have it. So it's aabf.org, alpha alpha bf. So like, you know, Bravo Foxtrot. And that's the Alicia and Byrne Foundation. And they're a very good local player for Burns. Um, Nick here, as you can see, this is for people who have a neurotypical independent communication disorders. So this is something that a woman came up with to help children understand burn safety who didn't have normal educational abilities. So that's out there and that's a really cool freaking thing, right? So that's on the same organization. Mm -hmm. Now, don't confuse that with the Children's Burn Foundation and that's another player and these guys specifically, wait, I see something up here like a chat. Okay. Um, yes, thank you so much for doing that, for posting those in here. So the children, the childburn.org is another player that's local. And um, so as you can see, we're in the middle of Burn Awareness Week. You can see they also have the programs, um, resources, educator resources. And on that note, one thing that they have that is really cool is this entire book that's designed for teachers for K through three. Now our teaching staff, like especially LAUSD, they're not allowed to use this stuff unless the district allows them. So this kind of information has been falling to scout troops and other nonprofits to distribute to children. But just know that this is another player in the area a note that in Sherman Oaks, another local player. So we've got some great local organizations on burn safety. So the other thing is you can see that they have their, um, let me look at that. Um, this, I want to show you very quickly. Do I have time? To, how much time do I have? Like 20 minutes? Am I cool? Yeah, more than that. We go into 11 and it's only six after 10 now. I'm a little concerned about we didn't click the thing. I, I may have to go unshare because I have to make sure that you guys can hear the audio on this. Injury from those can you hear items. The audio? So that's yep. just a few things I want you to remember uh, about. I want you guys to, uh, I'm just going to bring this up to the meat and potatoes. So this is the Chattanooga Fire Department. And, I would. and they're showing you some of the common things that they respond to with household fires and having retired from the gas company, I can assure you, really, I can assure you, this is not much different than what I've seen here in Los Angeles, especially with stove safety, which I'm gonna to go to my phone in a few minutes and show you some things that maybe you're not aware Captain of. Captain Hartung, take that away. These are some practices we've seen out in the community when we've gone into homes and we want people to be safe. We have an overloaded outlet with an extension cord that runs under an area rug. And if that area rug was to abrade the insulation of the extension cord, it could catch fire and you wouldn't even know it. Another thing, an extension cord is to be used in a temporary use only. It is not to be used for permanent wiring. We also have a space heater with a broom sitting in front of it. 
the broom is too close to the space heaters. Space heaters, if they are being utilized, need to have three foot of clearance in all directions. When you get done with the extension cord, make sure that you unplug it. Do not leave extension cords plugged in. That is unsafe. Same thing with our iron. Once we get done using our iron, we want to unplug it as well. Because if the heating element fails in this, it's going to fail in the on position. We do not want to use a duplexer in our outlet. The outlet has two holes in it for a reason. Only two things should be plugged in at a time, not overloaded. If you overload your outlet, it could short circuit. If it does short circuit, you need to isolate the power by disconnecting it at the breaker box. Sending a fire department wants you to be aware of fire safety in the bedroom. If you do sleep with your door closed and you are experiencing a smoke detector activation, a smoke detector goes off in your house, do not immediately open the door. Seal the door from the top all the way down to the bottom. If it is hot, do not open it. If you open it, you're inviting that smoke into your bedroom. Instead, seal the bottom of the door with a blanket, get to the window, break it if you have to, open it, scream for help. Fire department will go into rescue mode and retrieve you from that window. And I want to talk about what happens when somebody receives a burn. Um, certainly, it's super important that if uh, you are in a fire, if you get struck by uh, lightning or you have an electrical burn, we want to remove that person from that burning process, but only if it's safe. So you may have to isolate the power from the breaker box and make sure that electricity to the appliance is off. You may have an entrance and an exit wing from the electricity, and if there's life-threatening bleeding, you'll have to control it. We want to check and see if somebody's breathing, if they have a pulse. Uh, if not, then you'll have to start CPR. All of these require that you initiate the 911 process and get fire and rescue on the way to help treat you. Uh, if you have deep tissue burns, you certainly uh, can treat them by applying a cool, wet cloth. We avoid any petroleum products, so no Vaseline, no Neosporin, no butter. All that does is make the burn work. Cover it with a clean, wet cloth uh, and then transport to the hospital. The other thing we have to think about are organ injuries. When electricity passes through your body, uh, it follows the path of least resistance, so that means that it can electrify your heart, you can have burns to your lungs, not only from electricity, but the fire, you can have inhalation burns, and you get swelling uh, at a later date. If the person's well enough, if they have rings on, if they have a belt, anything that's constricting, go ahead and get that off uh, as long as it's safe to do so. That way, if swelling occurs, uh, they won't have uh, additional injury from those items. So those are just a few things I want you to remember uh, about Burn Awareness Week. And so basically what they're talking about with that is, you know, we see people all the time, they try to pick it out. Oh, hello puppy, come here, he's in his eggs. Um, when you pull a plug out, you should pull it by the body that plugs into the outlet. Aaron, talk louder. We can't hear you, Aaron. Okay, military talk. When you yep. remove a, a plug from the wall, make sure you're removing the plug, not the wire attached to the plug. Don't play tug of war with your outlet because that can cause a problem and it can compromise it, okay? So the other thing that's really super cool is that the American Burn Association uh, who are not local to us, but they have a great system now. It's the ABCs of burn prevention. And so they have all these one, one PDF, uh, you know, PNGs here that match a letter to the alphabet. And it shows you different things that you can do for like just one topic that maybe you want to talk about. For example, non-fire cooking burns is really common. So things like just touching, like my daughter burned her hand one year because her husband took the pan out of the oven and put it on top of the stove, but he didn't tell her that, hey, honey, that just came out of the oven. So my daughter with her bare hand grabbed a 400 degree stainless steel baking <coughs> frying pan 
and immediately just started just started blistering. And this was like at midnight on a Friday. My daughter called me screaming into the phone. I thought she was being killed. Because louder. Louder? Yeah. Okay. So my daughter ended up having really a bad burn and I went down the street to go help her and it was my daughter who was screaming. It was my daughter who was hurt. And that really affected me. And you know, Alhambra Hospital, you could see it from the window, but you know, I had to get her over there, but we had to cool the burn for 10 minutes under cool running water. And it was blistering under the water. So you got to remember that when you treat burns, the people are in a lot of pain. It doesn't look like the Red Cross video. They're yelling, they're distraught. Uh, it's just burns are very painful. They could also have no pain at all if the nerves have been damaged. But these are great public service announcements, announcements that the American Burn Association has. And the new one that I saw that made me giggle a wee bit is vaping. Apparently, people can't tell when the vape device is overheating due to a bad battery and they're getting facial burns. Another reason not to use these ridiculous things. So anyway, we're having problems. Uh, and this is just another, uh, they're lithium batteries. They leave them in the car. I guess they're overheating. And anyway, these are just some really great public service things when we have our next in-person emergency preparedness fair. These would be some great things to maybe, you know, hand out. So the other uh, players, I see, where is this one? No, it's not this one. The, uh, I wanted to show you this because I think with our crowd, we know this, but again, don't put water on grease fires. Am I loud enough still? Yeah. Okay. I want you to watch this, but what I want you to pay attention to is the people's reactions. And I want you to type into the chat why you think they're doing what they're doing. Uh, Dan, I know from you being a training officer and all that, you're going to see it right away. But let's watch what happens to these young kids here who are working in fast food. Oh, we got a problem. Oh, what do I do? Well, that doesn't look right. It doesn't normally do that. <laughs> he's still not talking to his buddy because he's looking at it and going, huh, I... <laughs> What do I do with that? Well, I'll move that because I'm sure that'll help. Oh, dude, what's that? I don't know, man. I don't think they trained us on this. Maybe. I don't know. Oh, no, I don't know. What do I do? I don't think we covered this in LAUSD. I don't know what to do. What do we do with this? Uh, I know. I'm going to pace. Let me go get somebody. I'll go. Uh, wait, I can't go this way. There's not a way out. Wait, maybe that's a bad way to go. Maybe I should go the other way. That's it. I'll go this way because at least I, oh, wait, maybe, no, I'll go this way. Wait. No, Unbelievable. I, I'll throw water on it. Yes, there we go. Because <laughs> and the morals of that story is don't do that. Um, you know, when you have uh, the other YouTube I had was just guys setting their barbecues on fire because people don't clean their barbecues. They let grease accumulate and accumulate and accumulate, and then the whole thing catches fire. So we got to make sure that we understand that how important it is that your pans are clean. And then here's the burn gel. We want to make sure you have great clarity over burn cream and burn gel. Burn gel is a product that actually removes heat from the skin. Whereas burn cream is just really something that you do that has uh, proprietary, you know, it has some pain killing benefits. Louder. Is everybody else is like, yeah, okay. I'm having a hell of a time trying to hear you. Well, that's crazy because everything is... There's... In, in the audio, in your computer, there should be a way to turn up the microphone. Yeah, everything is uh, really loud. On, 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 on. Aaron, I had problems with my computer too. Right and so I use these, you know, the ear things. And they have been a game changer. Uh huh. So yeah. maybe just, yeah, you know, for your future. Have, yeah, yeah. My mic is uh, up all the way. Everything. What, what about at the, at the, the bottom, bottom bottom left where you have the little microphone symbol? It's the microphone audio, not choosing the microphone. Right. The, the audio at the bottom on the right. 
Yeah, this one. Yeah, see if that's all the way up. Yeah, it's probably your computer because mine's the same way. That's why I had to get the AirPods and they've been a game changer. Right. Well, I know one thing that, that'll, that'll uh, oops, sorry. Here's what'll really solve this problem is right now what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be going to my phone very briefly because what I wanna show you guys is, I, let me finish the, uh, the thing about the burn gel. And then I'm going to go back. I'm sorry. I've accidentally blotted you guys. Blotted you guys out. And, and we have a question in the chat saying, what is the difference between burn gel and burn cream again? Yes. Yeah, so burn cream, if you read the directions on, you read the material in it, it's like kind of Tylenol for the skin. Whereas burn gel is meant to be, it's usually in uh, on a four by four gauze and it pulls the heat out of the burn. So let's say you're on a boat, you're camping, you're somewhere where you don't have a lot of water to rinse off a burn, right? Because seawater on a burn would probably not be your best call, right? <laughs> um, but anyway, so the gel is meant when you don't have a lot of water. So let's say you got a contact burn from your backpacking stove but the only water you have for the next three hours is this, you know, little water bottle. You probably don't want to burn all of your drinking water uh, on this burn. So that's what the burn gel is designed for. And because it's like a gel, it seals the nerves and it keeps them from hitting the air and being very painful. So it's meant to do that. So what you're looking at on the screen right now is a fourth degree burn. That's when the heat goes all the way to the bone. Uh, Dan was sharing before the meeting started about how he had, you know, had what we call a contact burn from heat packs. And the heat just slowly kept cooking inside the skin and we can't see it. And you don't always feel it and it can actually get infected and become a bad burn and you don't even know it. So people with diabetes who maybe have neuropathy and can't feel their extremities may get a burn and not even know that it's there. So when you look over here, um, whoop, not, not that, we wanna come here, not where, there's FEMA, here's CERT. Everybody, can you see the cert? Give me a thumbs up if you can see the cert. All right. So let's see how burns changed for cert. They want you and you're seeing safety to make sure, hey, it's electrical, don't touch the person. Are you stepping into an unsafe condition, something that's hot? Now here, preventing hypothermia, managing pain and reducing risk of infection. So right, gloves, they're losing a lot of body heat because the skin's been affected. So make sure that you're remembering to treat for shock. So you have heat, chemicals, electrical, and radiation, which is the same as sunburn, right? So they tell you the things that you need to think about and they just give you the definitions because when you're doing the triage, you probably wanna be able to convey, hey, this person has burns. They are partial thickness burns. This is the terminology we would use on our medical you know, triage thing. We, we don't want to just say burn because that's kind of probably not really helpful. Please note here, this is where we're going to remove them from the burning source that might require an emergency move of the person, right? We do not use ice. Everybody nod for my benefit. There's no ice going on. Okay, we don't do that. You cover the burn loosely, not the way we do a burn, like a bleeding wound, but dry, loose dressings. If you have a wet towel, like in first aid stations or something, great. Now by wet, we don't mean soaking wet, we mean damp. So it keeps the air from going in and the coolness of the cloth continues to cool the burn. Notice again, we don't apply antiseptics like the nurse said uh, at, you know, uh, in Tennessee fire there. We don't remove any clothing, we don't break blisters. Don't confuse it like you would a friction blister on a run or something, a sporting event. Now there's a lot of hazmat burns out there. So if you see somebody covered in a chemical and you don't have the proper protective equipment to enter, then you're not gonna be able to. And I know a certain people that really assaults our senses. 
but you can't walk into a hazmat situation if you don't have the proper PPE. If it's a dry irritant, you're gonna gently brush away as much as possible and make sure you don't brush it onto yourself. The rule, lots of cool running water for at least 10 minutes. So you could see how in a cert setting, a mass casualty thing, that would be hard to do. So then they get into like the wound care. So that's what changed. Notice that Burns is now two and almost a half pages. And the previous cert, it, it was very lightly touched on. So um, with that, I'm gonna do something really quickly here. I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna stop sharing here. And what I'm gonna do, Sandy, I'm joining by phone, okay? Okay. Hey, Aaron, yeah. I, I, I don't know when to ask you this, but you, you had something earlier with uh, from kindergarten to like second or third grade, a uh, teacher's guide. Where yeah. was that? I, I didn't get a chance to. Oh, that was with the, uh, the, the Children's Burn Association. Oh. Yeah. So the Children's Burn Association has the K through third workbook for teachers or health educators to use because they don't cover it in school anymore because they changed the curriculum. So this kind of social stuff doesn't get covered like it used to when we were kids. So Sandy, I'm joining by a phone right now and I'm going to click off here. Okay, I bet you can hear me better now. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have to leave the meeting here. And jogging back over here. Yes, the iPhone is superior to my very expensive desktop computer. Go <laughs> figure. But I want to do talk about the stove being from a retired gas company perspective. I'm going to show you something that maybe you don't know about. I know Brent knows this, but you know, I'm always, always amazed at what people don't know about home safety when it comes to their stove. You know, when our grandmothers, uh, they always had a lid. So if you're cooking something on the stovetop, fire safety 101, burn safety 101, is you have a lid so that you don't get splattered and you don't get burned that way. So a lid is one of the fastest ways to put out a fire that happens on your pan. Put a lid on it and take away the oxygen and watch how that works for you. But most people can't even find the lids to their pans, right? <laughs> the other thing that you wanna be able to do is you'll notice that there's some canisters here. It was very common back in the day for our grandmothers to have canisters of flour next to the stove. It wasn't just because they were going to use it, but because you could throw flour on a fire, obviously you don't wanna splash grease. But just letting you know in the old days, they always had flour near something because they would put flour on a fire if they had to, but not water. Now, the other thing that you really should do for burn safety in the home, and you're gonna laugh, but yeah, so this is right next to my stove. I wear it every single time I'm at the stove. Yes, that's right, an apron. You've heard me talk about it before. And this is my beautiful thick, thick apron that I use for cooking. And what it's done is that if you spill something on yourself, the apron is designed to absorb the heat and the scalding fluid, not ruin your clothes, and more importantly, not burn you. So aprons were a thing that were very common, right, Linda? Remember that? You know, Mickey, right? Sally? We, everybody had aprons. And it's fallen away, but it's actually a safety item so that when you're cooking, if something spills, it's not burning you. So it can't be a cheesy uh, apron like this Girl Scout cookie one that's super thin. No, you want a nice thick one that if you dropped grease on you, you could pull it back and then you're off, right? And then you take off your apron and then you're not burned, the apron is. Aaron, Brent has a question. Yes. Brent? Yes, sir. I, I hate, I'm, 
the, the number of times that I disagree with you are almost zero. You are phenomenal at what you do. But something you said is a little bit dangerous. Okay, go for it. Throwing um, uh, milled grains like flour onto a fire, if you throw them and as you throw oh. them, they aeros aerosolize a little bit, they can explode. So grain, while normally it's safe, uh, if it's thrown, can be almost explosive. So salt is a heck of a good thing to throw. Uh, flour is a very bad thing to throw. Yeah, I agree. I would never want to say the word throw either. And, you know, you're right. If you aerolized anything, that would like sugar is bad. Flour is bad. But yeah, so I mean, the lid is superior. And uh, thank you for catching me on that. I never object to that at all. Yeah, our grandparents used to use flour because that's what they had. But obviously, it is far better to have a lid for your pan or your pot. Yes, and salt so, is safe. Yes, yeah, salt, is, salt is. And thank you for adding that because I had forgotten that. But don't use sugar and don't use rice because those things will like take on the fluid and the air and the oxygen and become like bombs. So yeah, and especially in you know, a water as you saw from that example. Um, and thanks for that for Brett. I really appreciate you backing me up on that. Now let's list a pan and YouTube, by the way, is full of this. You have people who panic and the pan catches fire and then somebody wants to pick it up and start dancing around with it. <laughs> And, you know, we see it constantly. And uh, I'm not sure what it is other than, you know, panic. And this gets back into how do we, as people who are into emergency preparedness, encourage people to think about things before they happen. Well, that's what we do at Lake Balboa Neighborhood Council EP, right? How do we get these messages out to people that you don't start dancing around like you're a hula dancer with fire? Um, you know, you just got to teach people that, hey, it goes like this, you know, you got to put it out. Now, the other thing that I noticed uh, at the gas company, we saw this a lot. Um, and that is that, uh, you know, does everybody know that the top of their stove lifts up? Yeah. So this thing is hinged, like you take your burners out, and then this whole thing pops up. Not going to do that to mine right now because that would cause a little bit of a, a cleaning issue, but I'm going to show you the seam for it. So see this right here, right? See I'm backed up. See all this right here? That pops up and underneath that you can clean. And it's the same for like with these guys. I'm sorry for that loud noise. When you look at these, these can be cleaned as well. And then these guys. So these guys, when you have the igniters, you don't want grease to get up in here. And the way that at the gas company, we would clean these guys is with an emery board, the same one you use for your nails. Because the igniter pin, which is right here. Right, whoops, sorry. Mm -hmm. It clicks. And if you have trouble starting it, sometimes you need to take it and clean it a little bit so that it ignites properly. Mm -hmm. So you got to maintain your stove like you do any other product. Right. Oven cleaner so, works too. Oven cleaner works on those too. It does make sure that you but rinse you it really. It. Right. You have yeah. to rinse it really well. <laughs> I'm a clean, I'm a clean fanatic, so I can tell you all of the little tips about cleaning. Yes, us military women are really good at that. <laughs> it's like, but it's it's amazing. Like the other thing you see that's crazy is like people will let grease all gather in here and on these. You can put your burners, that's what these guys are, right? You can put these in your dishwasher or soak them like every six months. I do mine every month because I'm crazy, but you don't want grease to gather on that either. But just know that this entire thing lifts up like the hood of a car, right? And then, you know, for grease, some people need to pour it out and they're walking around the kitchen with a hot pan. No. So one trick that chefs do is they'll take foil and they'll 
put it inside of a, a very uh, glass tempered cup, right? Don't use something fragile like Tupperware, dear heaven no. And what you wanna do is put it in there and it's right next to you. Mm -hmm. So don't be dancing with a pan full of hot grease. Like you can see in my kitchen, it's kind of a problem because the sink is all the way over there to the stove. So that makes it kind of a walk for me and you just don't wanna be dancing around with that. So the other thing I wanna talk about is your fire extinguisher. Um, don't have the fire extinguisher next to the stove. You need to have it, and I'm gonna, you're gonna laugh where I keep mine. Here's my, my humble little liquor cabinet. No, I hardly ever, I never drink this liquor. My friends bring it over, and then since I hardly ever drink, it just accumulates. But notice that this is where I keep my fire extinguisher. <laughs> You gotta love it, right? Now, why do I do that? Because if I walk into my kitchen and I see that there's a problem, well, one, always get out, right? Like we're not firefighters. But if I have a small fire and I see that, oh my God, that's a problem, I can, my fire extinguisher is not gonna be next to the thing that's on fire. And people make that mistake. They put the fire extinguisher next to the thing that they think they're gonna use it on. Well, if that's engulfed, then you're gonna kind of have a problem, right? So when they were talking about using a towel, like let's say it's someone elderly or it's a baby, they have very thin skin. So if they get burned, putting a cloth on and then continuing to run it under water. And when you get this towel wet and you continue to run it, that wet towel will continue to pull heat out of the burn. And that's the way we want to do it because if the skin's been burned and you just have water hitting the skin that's been burned, that's going to be super, super painful, right? And it may even tear the skin. So we don't want the water to blast directly on the skin. We want it to shed off, right? Because that's going to make the heat in a gentle way. And then using a towel, letting the water hit the towel and it acts as a heat sink and it pulls the heat out. For those of you who have done first aid stations with me, you know that we've been using towels for, uh, you know, cold towels now for a long time to reduce heat injuries. Now, I wanna walk you through something and I want you to, I want this to be interactive, okay? I want everybody to get on their boards and get ready to start typing in answers. I wanna see answers. Come on, I mean everybody. Linda, Dan, Dave, I want everybody to tap in answers, okay? So I want to walk through something with you. So, right, I'm going to go to my chat because I want to watch what people type in. So my daughter and her ex-husband had an apartment and my son-in-law was in the back and he heard the smoke detector go off. So he just went in and uh, what he did was is, uh, he just, you know, reached up with a broomstick and turned the button off. He didn't look to see why the smoke detector went off. He thought the apartment smelled funny, but he went back to his bedroom, uh, back to the room and he who's taking a nap, see? And he went back to sleep and he closed the door in case the fire alarm went off again because he thought there was something wrong with the battery. Why is that a problem? What, what was the first mistake there? <laughs> what do you guys think? I wanna hear what you think. What, what do you think? Type that in. What's the problem? What's the problem, everybody? Yeah, thank you, Tammy, yeah. Thank you, Brenda. Yeah, Dave, right. That's what I told my son-in-law too. Yeah, all the above, son, right? Assume there's a fire. Like, you got to look. Like, oh, that's funny. My fire extinguisher doesn't, I mean, fire detector doesn't, smoke detector, excuse me, doesn't normally do that. So he goes back and he goes, oh my gosh, the smoke detector went off again. My son-in-law comes back out of the bedroom and he looks down the hallway that is now filled with smoke and he sees something in the living room down the hallway on fire on the carpet. Now he has no way out of this apartment except out of a three-story window and he's not, doesn't have a ladder. Yeah, thank you, Bernard. You would think, right? Call <laughs> 911, your stuff is on fire. So he has to walk past the fire to get out of the apartment. So this was not helpful either. And then he actually forgot to call 911 because he saw that the thing was on fire. So he steps over the fire and he realizes that it's the microwave door that is flown from the kitchen 
over the stove and out, you know, some places have a cutout in between the kitchen and the living room. Well, anyway, it was the microwave door and it was on fire in the middle of their living room. What's your first thought? What are you thinking? If you saw that, what would you be thinking to yourself? The microwave door is in the middle of my living room on the carpet on fire. What do you think you have going on? Other than I'm leaving, right? <laughs> <laughs> only you Brent only you <laughs> Brent's right yeah good aerodynamics it was a great tumble yes thank you Mac. yeah thanks Mac. yeah something blew up um don't drive <laughs> yes what right it's like obviously the microwave has just had a major malfunction something blew up well this encouraged my son-in-law to look to his left towards the kitchen because obviously the door came from there, because like Brent just said, amazing aerodynamics. And now the entire kitchen wall is on fire on the rack where the microwave is, where they had a row of cooking books right above it. So now we have these books that's on fire, the wall's on fire. And um, so now my son-in-law decides, uh, yes, yes, he is still my son-in-law. He's actually, a, he's just not, He's just not trained because um, he, he, he actually made the joke that only people like me have fire extinguishers, which I think is kind of sadly true. But anyway, he goes, to, he steps over the fire in the living room to go get the fire extinguisher instead of going out the door because now he's realized he can't get back to the bedroom where his phone is. Because he wouldn't think he's in an apartment, for God's sakes, go knock on somebody's door. But no, he jumps over the fire again to get his cell phone. He comes out. He doesn't call. He gets the fire extinguisher. So he takes the fire extinguisher and my son-in-law doesn't know how to use a fire extinguisher. But by some act of God, he gets it open and he hits the wall and he doesn't understand that it's a big cloud and that it bounces back. So he didn't know how to hit the fire at the base. And uh, then he turned around and saw that the carpet now was a six foot fire blocking his way to the door. He hits that with the fire extinguisher and then he stands there and he, and he realizes that he can't breathe the air anymore because it's contaminated. And he, he walks out and um, here's uh, what do you think? What do you think's the root cause? Brent, you can't play because you already know the answer. I know it. What do you think happened? What happened with that microwave? Type that in for me. Tell me what you think. Yes, electrical Celeste, go another step farther with that. Was it the outlet? Yes, they had a GFI. And my daughter shared with me, she goes, I guess that wasn't wise of us that we kept resetting it. Huh. <laughs> so they didn't understand, and I've done a short survey with friends, that people think when they're GFI trips that you fix it by resetting it. Type that in. What do you do if your GFI shuts off the power to your outlet? And let's say you have a toaster plugged into that or a microwave plugged into that. What is your next logical step with that? What do you think? Type that in. Yeah, find the cause. Unplug the device. That's it, right? Because what is the outlet, the GFI, the ground fault indicator? What is it telling you? Yes, call an electrician. Because something ain't right, as they like to say in the South, right? It ain't right. So either the GFI itself is faulty, the appliance is faulty, maybe the breaker is faulty, but nonetheless, something be faulty. Turns out that my daughter and son-in-law had reset that thing about a dozen times because they just thought, and I thought, wow, a lot of the public does not understand that a GFI failing is something that needs to be resolved. They think you just reset it. And this is the cause of a lot of electrical appliance fires because people don't understand GFIs. And the uh, arc interrupters, what? Well, I have to go into chat and see that. So, right, so I'm gonna go back so I can see Dave's whole comment there. Yeah, now available as plug-in circuit breakers. That's cool. That's very, yeah, throw away. Yeah, you're right, Brenda. I mean, chances are the toaster has something wrong with it. 
it's the Bernard. It's the toast fault. You're so funny, right? Don't don't eat, don't eat toast. It's bad for you. Um, yeah, and Dan, and Dan said the GFIs are often wired together with other plugs, so it could be something plugged into another plug in the area. Oh, daisy chaining is a huge problem, and that's the people who will take something and there's uh there's places you can go online to add it up. Like um, I'm going to show you what I do. Um, because it looks like visually from a distance that I'm daisy chaining, but in reality, um, I have this plugged into the wall and this is how I do all of my electronics. Now it looks really bad when you look at it like this, you're like, this girl's crazy. Look at all these electronics. You got your goal zero. You've got your radio from the sheriff's department. You've got all these other things, but this guy right here is my extension cord that is protected from getting too much. And I added up each of the appliances that are plugged in to one panel to make sure that it did not go over the allowable amount of wattage that was uh, needed. So what you wanna do is actually you're supposed to calculate, like people will plug in a outlet, right? An outlet strip, not even a, a surge protector. And they think as long as there's a hole, that means that they can plug something into it. This is not the case. You cannot exceed the capability of the, uh, of the plug. And Brent is a much more brilliant person to talk about that than I. There was a, <coughs> uh, Brenda, there was one fire extinguisher. <coughs> Just thinking about it makes me cough. <laughs> And my son-in-law, he put it out and he's standing up and instead of immediately leaving the apartment, <clears throat> he tried to clean it up. I guess he gets points for that. <clears throat> but when he turned around and saw the bigger fire, he hoofed it. And he had to use the fire extinguisher to escape the fire department, to escape the fire in the apartment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the moral to the story is, you need to have enough fire extinguishers in your home in ABC. And electrical is one of the number one reasons why people are having some home fires along with the contact burns. Uh, children, they're about 37% of all burns. And it's usually due to hot food, like pulling coffee down on top of themselves because when people get children, they don't always change their habits. So what does this mean for us as, as CERT people and neighborhood council people? One, we have to reach out to the community and do our best. Um, go ahead, what, Brent, also know where the, yeah, oh yeah, Brent, you're so right. They cover this in CERT a lot, how to turn off the utilities properly. And as you know, Brent and I tell people all the time, you gotta know how to turn off the circuit breaker. Um, and then for people in apartments, sometimes they don't even have access to them or people block access to them. Uh, I, I lived in one place where the circuit breaker for my guest house was in somebody's garage that I didn't have access to. And I said, that's just not acceptable. <laughs> you know, this is not acceptable, but uh, you gotta know how to do that. So educating the public, you know, um, making sure that not just Edison or Duop DWP comes out, but that people understand that they got to know how to treat burns and mostly how to prevent them. And the barbecues are a big one. Let's not even go into fireworks. So, right, I know it's just like really, you can't, as we say in EMS, you can't fix stupid. Um, so just on, uh, yeah, just understand that even on microwaves. Uh, People are still putting metal objects in microwaves and turning them on. Often it's because they're altered or they have a mental illness or job security. Yes, Bernard, it, it is, as we say in EMS, job security, but good God, you know, it's, um, yes, but look at like 2020, like, you know, you're absolutely right, Dave, look at how long that took, but that's only gonna be on remodels and new construction. And when you think about like the gas company, we have almost 6 million homes out in the system that have gas meters. Oh, it's 2021, fantastic. Right, so it goes back to us knowing how to shut off that electricity, the water and everything else. And now having fire extinguishers in the right place. Notice that my fire extinguisher is on the way into the kitchen. 
right? I, I can't have it next to the stove that doesn't buy me a cup of coffee, right? So I also have a fire extinguisher that's between my bedroom and the front door because I would use it to escape my house if it was on fire. I, I wouldn't use it to, to do anything else but get out. And that's something that you really also gotta, gotta know. So that's all the changes with burns, uh, burn cream, burn gel. And then I did wanna let everybody know, um, we are having classes, uh, Soteria. Uh, we're having a EMR renewal and an EMR full class. And if you go to our website, Sandra put up all the dates. Um, Heidi, we also have a pet first aid class coming up very soon and a wilderness. Um, and they're all remote. So even EMR, we're giving people a mannequin and we're giving them all the equipment to take home. And that is allowed by Red Cross. And so um, the mannequin and everything, the BVM and all the supplies, whether you're doing a review or a full class, we send you home with all the equipment and we do it by Zoom. And so um, just for anybody who, um, yeah, the, the, the pet thing is really a lot of people want to do the pet thing where we're getting a lot of requests for that. So, uh, and then the wilderness, I want to encourage you people in CERT, even if you're not a backpacker or a hiker, the wilderness class for Red Cross is also for disaster people. And it's about, do you stay or go? And it's about leadership and how to manage a team when you're dealing with a medical emergency. So you may wanna think about the class, if nothing else from that paradigm of how to work with people who are trained less than yourself. Because everybody here on this group is a pretty evolved, pretty well-trained group of people. So let's face it, in emergency preparedness, when we're actually like, a, we actually, the DART team got called out for the winds and we got called out for, the, um, for several fires out here recently. So our disaster community team is being deployed by the sheriff's department. So we actually have been getting calls and going out and assisting the public. Um, <clears throat> they don't use CERT, but they use the DART team, but that's because they have way more training than the CERT. But they did call out our CERT team for the pandemic and helping people uh, relocate. So, you know, but that's Ventura. So anyway, that's everything I have on burns. It is National Burn Week. Please think about that. Think of any uh, community groups that you may work with who, uh, you know, that might be of value to them, daycares, schools, et cetera. And maybe then when we do our next emergency preparedness fair, we can maybe use that as a, you know, another thing that we help people understand the difference between burn cream and burn gel and how to treat burns, right? Right. Anyway, that is everything I have for you guys today on National Burn Week. Erin, thank you so much. <laughs> hey, Aaron. Could, could, could you put in chat that link to that uh, kindergarten through second grade oh, yeah, um, yeah. teachers? Because I, I can't find it. I Googled it and yeah, it's not there. No Linda? Yes. Linda, yes. Can, I sh can I share a short video? Which sure. one? Me, Linda. Uh, you got nine minutes. Yeah, it's less than that. <laughs> and then I have a question for Aaron. Okay. Okay. Go ahead with your your question, Linda. Okay. Very quickly, uh, Aaron, can you put the uh, website in the chat so that we can view your upcoming classes and schedule? We'd appreciate it. It's already there. Oh. Yeah, I did. There. I already did. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah, sure. and Sandy, I'm coming back in from my computer, okay? Okay. I'll think okay, about it. Okay, Dan, go for it. Right. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> Barbecues, I gotta tell you. It's, uh, it's amazing. No. <laughs> what if it's the first time she's ever done that? <laughs> <laughs> That's not how to do it. No. no, and I love and I love how everybody just stands a while around and watches and no one helps. 
<laughs> and you'll notice the fire didn't go out. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. And once again, thank you so very much. You, we always learn great things from you, and you're our favorite speaker. You know that. We yes, love that's you. true. So true. And Sally Thompson has a question. We were delighted to have you. Sally? Yeah, I just want to congratulate Erin uh, on her weight loss. You look absolutely fantastic. I knew when you first came on, your, your face already looked thinner. So I knew something was going on, but 30 pounds, I mean, a big congratulations and to I you. And I have to thank you, Erin, as well, because I, I've taken some of your weight. So I appreciate <laughs> <laughs> you. You, you, lost <laughs> you lost it. We found it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> hey, I want to go ahead. I'm going to like uh, type this in right now. I'm going to like copy. I'm going to go to the chat. Here is where that book is. Control V. Boom. All right. Gotcha, buddy. Right there. That's the uh, childburn.org. Sure, and they're in Sherman Oaks. Got it. Just copied it. Thank you. Anybody else have anything before we go? Yes, Erin. Oh, go ahead. Real quick, um, Aaron, I want you to know I saved my dog's life from the pet first aid. She was choking on something a couple, about three months ago. And she's a little, about 12 pounds. And I ended up having to put her upside down, upside down and kind of shake her. And yeah, and patted her in the back there. And um, I, it nothing fell out, but she started breathing again. Aww. She was yeah. not breathing at all. Wow. Yeah. I thought she was going to die in my arms, but Aww. yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tammy. You bet. Thank you, Erin. All of Erin's classes are wonderful, and her, her EMR class, I cannot praise too highly. I've had it at least three times and maybe four, I'm not sure, but you learn something in every class that Erin teaches. I highly recommend it. it. It costs some money, and it costs some time, but it's worth every penny and every minute, I promise you. It is absolutely life-changing. Yeah. Do take it if you possibly can. It has a, a lot new material now and a lot more skills to it. So we feel we feel terrible. I mean, I wish we could find funding to get it covered, but just the books and the materials and the you know and the certifications, it's like, boy, you know. And uh, the way the Red Cross does it now is that they pretty much want the instructors to bear the burden because you know the Red Cross doesn't even have their own equipment anymore. They teach very few classes. It's mostly independents who do the work now. So, and, and the mannequins have got to be electronic now to measure your progress and you have to submit it. So, wow. yeah, so add that cost. And I think it cost us $100, $100 per mannequin to upgrade our equipment. Wow. Unreal, but it is fun. I mean, it's cool, but it's just, uh, we feel really bad that the program's Lost as much as they do. It's very disappointing for me. And we wish we could get grant money, but it's not out there. And I wish LAFD would really reconsider upping the game for cert on the medical, but I can't see where we go. Okay. Thanks Thank for having you. me. I'll be here next month just as a spectator again, you know. And uh, any questions, let me know about the classes and uh, let me know. Uh, some of you already have the book, so, you know, it may be better for you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? Dan, uh -huh. did you have your hand up? No. Oh, okay. Anybody else with questions or comments? Well, I was just wondering what Aaron's going to talk about next month. Is <laughs> 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 it when is Pet Month again? We should do a pet thing. That's like I'll look it up and I'll let Linda know what other things are coming up. So okay. Yeah. So great oh, yeah, to there see was everybody. one thing. The USS Iowa is having some radio, I don't know if it was a contest with a PAPA system today, this weekend. So if you have analog PAPA or uh, other modes, they're having some USS Iowa talk to the people there or something or other. I can look it up if anyone's interested. Okay. Orlando's having the uh, hamcation too. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's the $10 one. Are there any uh, ham radio classes starting? Does anybody know? Um, there's online, um, hamstudy.org, and um, what's the other one he wrote? Um, oh. Gosh. Called ham what? National. Hamcation. Like a staycation, this is a hamcation in Orlando. But hamstudy.org, I could go there. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Linda, thank you so much for, and Sandy again for putting this on. It's so appreciated. It's yeah. great thank to see everybody. Um, the other one is wavetalkers.com. That was it. And once again, our thanks to Aaron, who we just adore. And thank you so very much, Aaron. We really appreciate it. All right, everybody, go out Always there. Good. How many of you have gotten your vaccination so far? Anybody? Yay, Dan. Me. Celeste, Mickey. I have Chris? an appointment for next week. I'm scheduled good. for the 28th. All Excellent. right. Well, okay. Rick and Mary and I have had our first doses, and we're due for another one, our second one in two weeks. So, I had I had my second Pfizer dose on Wednesday. Good. It was pretty worthless on Thursday, uh, but fine on Friday. Okay. And uh, President Biden ordered two million more doses. Two hundred oh, million, I think. Million. Yeah, yeah two hundred. Yeah. And uh, by April, the majority of us hopefully will be uh, vaccinated. Yeah, absolutely. Keep wearing those masks, guys. It's really yeah. worth it. I don't want to lose any of you. We need every single one of you in these EP meetings to share. So yeah. keep wearing those masks, washing your hands, doing the social distancing. Yeah. And remember to keep your pantries, your medic medicine cabinets, and your first aid kits filled. Yeah, yeah some of us look better with a mask on. And all your wine. <laughs> Listen, go through and check those things and see what needs to be thrown out because it's expired. Yeah. And, and update them. And keep your car half filled with gas at least at all times. Don't let it Always. go below a half a tank. We never yeah. know when we're going to have to get out of here. Not, not half right. empty. Yeah. Don't not forget to shake or shake your uh, fire, fire extinguishers yeah. twice a year. Right. Yep. Shake them up. Yep. All right, guys. Listen. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Happy Valentine's to all of you. Yeah. I happy you Valentine's. And a big love. I do. I do. Take care of yourselves, and we'll see you at the next meeting. Thanks so much. Love Bye. you all. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 <laughs>